Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and of course, their critics. One thing that especially fascinates me is things hidden in plain sight, things that are not obvious until someone points it out. And then once they do, you're like, yeah, I kind of knew that. It's hard for me to imagine a better example than the stars in the sky and the universal stories that are told about those. I mean, why all the epic myths? Why the heroic warrior god adventures? And why the heck are all civilizations from all different parts of the world telling the same story? Think about that last one for a minute. So, so there's this ancient guy in Polynesia sitting on a surfboard, looking up at some random blob of stars, because that's what they look like to most of us. And he's telling the same sacred story as some Viking in Iceland who's buried up to his waist in snow, and the same story that some African tribesmen hold sacred as something that's been passed on forever. That's not supposed to happen. That's not explainable by our current understanding of how anthropology works. We don't have any archaeological evidence to support why all these civilizations would be connected in that way. Well, today's returning guest, David Matheson, has almost single-handedly changed the way we think about stars and the star mists associated with them and this hidden in plain sight kind of thing that I just talked about. His books, Star Mists of the World, Volume 1, 2, 3. I think you're up to Volume 4 now, aren't you, David? Yeah, Volume 4 is Norse Myths, and it was published in 2018, Alex. You got to see, I'm one volume behind. Hard to keep up with this guy. And he's got a bunch of other books that we'll introduce you to. Excellent books. Overwhelmingly clear, convincing, I would say at this point, undeniable evidence for the universal star myth hypothesis. But what's really cool, and I know I'm going on here for a while, but I wanted to get it up to this point because what's really cool about today's interview and what we're going to get into is the messages behind those myths. So if we can get to the point of saying, yeah, that seems pretty undeniable, then we ought to take the next step and say, what might be the message behind it? I mean, if there was some great teacher, and just put a pin in that for a second, who took the trouble to spread this perennial wisdom throughout our world, throughout ancient civilizations, throughout our planet, then maybe we ought to figure out what they were trying to tell us. So that's what we're going to do today with fantastic guest, star myth master, David Matheson, who I have total respect for as a fellow seeker on the path. I pronoun to you, even though in typical skeptical fashion of inquiry to perpetuate doubt, I'm probably going to have some contentious points with you on a couple of these issues, but that's the kind of stuff I like to do, the level three discussion beyond the kind of usual stuff. It's so great to have you back, David. I'm so glad you initiated this because this whole conversation has taken on a life of its own that I am really, really excited to get in the middle of. So let me step back and say welcome and thank you for joining me. Well, thank you, Alex, and thank you for that kind and generous introduction. <laughs> so the conversation that we will have will be different than any other conversation because you'll bring out questions from your experience and background and perspective that nobody else can. Oh yeah, you can count on that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as I, as I told you, I'm kind of into my skeptico jeopardy phase, which has really been fun for me. I hope people are receiving it well. And that's what I thought we'd play today as a way of kind of framing up this chat we might have. And for those who are listening to the Skeptico Jeopardy board, here it is. Stars, purposely concealed, authentic self, the spiritual path, contact modalities on that wall, myth versus history, academia, and ancient aliens. <laughs> now, we really probably ought to start, even though I did a long introduction, with stars, because that's what this is about. And 
on your website, your excellent website, I picked up three phrases that I think are kind of key to the whole thing. So I explained what the star myth thing is, but please do it in your own language. And the three words are verifiable, universal, and profound. Profound, invisible realm that it opens us up to. So maybe you want to kind of take off on that. Great. Yeah, I'm already liking your format. So I'll take stars <laughs> for... Uh... Stars for a hundred thousand. And if you hear that's it, hundred thousand. I like the way you up the ante, buddy. That's it. Go right? big. This is, a, this is a game where you can only win the money. You can't actually lose the money. I can't lose a hundred thousand with this question, can I? No. <laughs> Good. So yeah, I've got my uh, my dog is calmly sitting nearby. He likes to be nearby. So if you hear any uh, distracting noises, don't blame me. It's uh, he's he, he's in his place. So star myths, um, the phrase I like to use is that virtually all of the world's ancient myths, scriptures, and sacred stories, as you said in the introduction, are based on a system of celestial metaphor. And people sometimes say, what, what are you talking about? Well, to make it even more precise, I would say virtually all the characters and episodes of the various myths, whether it's the myths of ancient Greece, the Norse myths, myths from the Pacific, like you alluded to in the opening, or from the Maya, or from North America, Africa, Australia, virtually all those characters and the episodes can be shown, can be shown to be based on specific constellations. The problem that many people have in getting their minds around even what I just said is, it's very difficult for most people to envision the constellation because we haven't been taught the constellations. That might be in a different square on Jeopardy, but for one reason or another, if I say, even to somebody who maybe reads astrology columns every day, if I said, can you sketch out the stars of Sagittarius or the stars of the constellation Gemini, they might have a difficult time actually sketching out the stars, the outline, or even pointing them out to me in the heavens, even though they know very uh, extensive knowledge about the system of what Gemini represents or uh, you know, what characteristics are associated with Gemini. Right. But well, once, David, I mean, just to yeah. interject, and you, sure. you do this all the time, I mean, it, the modern understanding of those constellations are that they must have been really, really bored and had a really wild imagination because to look at those random patterns and see what they see doesn't make any sense. That is the modern interpretation of it. So you kind of have two levels to bridge there. One is people are dismissing it because it's like, it, it, you, I can't see those things up there. And then number two, if even if you pointed it out to me, I'd say, well, it's just kind of silly from a bunch of people who are really bored and had a vivid imagination. That's right. Sometimes the term pareidolia comes up, you know, seeing shapes in the clouds. Well, we all can do that. Pareidolia is the human tendency. Some say it was an evolutionary tendency to see faces because if you're an infant, a smiling adult face could be your means of sustenance. So we kind of start to see faces everywhere. Oh, look at that tree. I see a face in it. That's that, that. There's a term for that called pareidolia. Carl Sagan actually talked about it in this uh, essay he wrote called "The Demon Haunted World," where he said, "Oh, people kind of imagine demons. It's kind of an angels. It's kind of a outgrowth of pareidolia." So, so I, I <clears throat> I'm trying to put a um, put the full weight of the anti argument, and I'll actually even say one further. We have to bridge even a third thing from what you said. You're right. How do, you know, you say, oh, that's just pareidolia. Dave, you're just seeing some shapes that you see. I don't even see those. I see different ones. Who's to say I'm, you're wrong or you're right and I'm wrong? But even further, <coughs> excuse me, I swallowed like a piece of dust. Even further would be to say, now, it would be very unlikely for a culture in Polynesian islands scattered across the Pacific to connect those stars the same way as ancient Greece on the entire opposite side of the globe um, without any 
contact. I mean, not too many people would, uh, in academia would allege that ancient Egyptians were in contact with ancient Maya or ancient Polynesia or Pacific Ocean. Um, and some constellations, people could say, well, you know what, the, the northern crown is very distinctive. It looks like an arc. I could see that being imagined as a necklace or a crown in many different cultures because humans wear necklaces. We all have necks. They wear crowns. We all have heads. That constellation, I could see that cropping up. But some of these connections are so arcane, so obscure, and some of these constellations are very difficult to pick out, even if you know what you're looking for, that it would be very hard to argue that around the world, people imagined the same constellations and imbued them with the same characteristics, and yet that's what we find in the myth. So I'm setting up an even higher or high jump that I have to try and jump onto, and yet this is just what the evidence overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly suggests. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't even have to get very far into this. I mean, you are truly, um, you're a researcher. I mean, you used to teach college there at West Point, right? So That's right. You're in, you, you understand academia, you understand what it takes to convince, you know, a body of intelligent people and you've way overshot the target, right? I mean, anyone who picks up your book, volume one, two, three, four, I mean, you're just going to be blown away. There's, there's no way this stuff can be explained away. And what's left is this huge mystery, which never will be explained away, because at least that's my contention, is that's part of the process. We don't, there's, maybe that's another skeptico, Jeopardy, a uh, board piece here, because purposely, concealed relates not so much to the constellations, but one of the things I picked up on what you talked about or alluded to is that at some point in our history, the chain of this spreading of wisdom was intentionally broken. And we kind of wound up with, uh, you know, this disconnect from this esoteric wisdom. Do you want to touch on that at all yeah so this is a this is a big part of the part of the story and when you say we you know it's almost worldwide at this point but really you had up on your skeptico square jeopardy square roman and it primarily happened i would argue in the roman empire in places that the roman empire conquered and those other parts of the world that didn't get conquered by the Roman Empire, such as India or China or North America, Central America, South America, the Pacific, stayed more in touch with their quote unquote original instructions, their ancient wisdom. The term original instructions, I'll give credit to Peter Kingsley, an author that people might want to check out. Peter Kingsley writes some very interesting analysis and, and fantastic books. The original instructions of every culture, wouldn't it be nice if we were all still in touch with the original instructions? But what happened at some point, and this is not really debatable, is something called literalist Christianity was instituted in the Roman Empire. How it, how it went from a small group to Emperor Constantine declaring that he was a Christian and then eventually declaring that Christianity was the, uh, was the official religion of the Roman Empire and some successive emperors between Constantine and Theodosius uh, kept upping the requirement to where, okay, Christianity is an official religion. Okay, now we've got to get rid of all the pagan gods. Okay, now we're going to shut down the temple at Delphi that had been in operation for at least eight centuries, maybe longer. The Eleusinian Mysteries of Greece, they were still going. The Eleusinian Mysteries had probably been going for 800 years or more when Theodosius shut them down in the late 300s AD. This is all historical, pretty indisputable. Some people might dispute it, but it's pretty well established that the Roman Empire became literalist Christian 
that in itself is a bit of a head scratcher. If you're a Christian literalist, you would say, well, it's God's providence. It would be pretty hard to take over the Roman Empire. <laughs> well, by force. let's we have to throw in there the kind of counter explanation for what's going on with Constantine and the Romans. And okay. it's uncomfortable for people because it sounds so conspiratorial. But it to me, it's the best way to line up with the facts. One, the church, quote unquote, that Constantine establishes is really an exact redo, reboot of the Roman existing uh, system that they have with the 12 pillars and the 12, that you know, whole thing. And then further, this is this is ushered in with serfdom, right? So rights of all the subjects are taken away. You can no longer own land. You can no longer even choose what job you have. You have to choose the profession of your, uh, of your parents and all these other restrictions that basically turn people into slaves. And in turn, what you get for that is eternal salvation. Oh, here, we have now have this state religion that we're going to support and you're going to follow it and then you'll get yours in heaven, I'll get mine now. So, I mean, you don't even have to be that cynical to see this as a massive kind of social engineering, social control kind of thing. And certainly, even if you don't, if you have a hard time wrapping your head around that, then you just fast forward and you see how it plays out. I mean, that's exactly how it plays out. So, even if you don't accept that that was the intention from the beginning, it's kind of hard to deny that. Well, yeah, that's a uh, that's an interesting way of, of putting it. I might not choose the exact same words in my description, but I'm in generally agreeing with what you're saying because that is what grew out of basically, I mean, some questions to be asked would be, well, why would you do it with Christianity if you've already got the pagan gods so-called or the ancient gods and the vestal virgins and all the different institutions of the the senate was kind of the protector of the traditional religion in the roman empire but um all those gods that you mentioned we know we're pretty familiar with the correspondence with the gods of ancient greece zeus goes right with jupiter in fact Zeus Pater, Pater means father in Roman or Latin, Zeus Pater or Jupiter, Zeus the father, Jove the father, corresponds directly to Zeus, and they were very comfortable with this. Mars corresponds with Aries, Venus with Aphrodite, and even when the Romans would be fighting the Germanic peoples of Northern Europe, you can read the accounts, the, there's plenty of texts and surviving accounts where they would say, oh, well, they have this God who corresponds to our Mars. They have this God who corresponds to our Hercules. They had no problem seeing um, around the world that there were, around their world, that the gods of other peoples, even under different names with slightly different clothing or characteristics or maybe facial hair, you know, Odin has a beard, whereas uh, Mercury doesn't or, um, you know, some slight different ways of worshiping, they still perceive, well, this God corresponds to this God. And even today we have Thursday, Thor's day, in Latinate languages or Romance languages is named after Jove, Jueves in Spanish, or Miércoles, Mercury's day. That's our Wednesday, Odin's day. Really interesting. That correspondence was understood. So, why did they have to get rid of that system or what? what yeah, but hold, hold on. I mean, you're, yeah, you're, yeah. that's that's awesome. And I'm with you on all that. But in there, I think, is, is the answer to the question that you're asking. The reason that they had to do it, they didn't have to do it. But that whole strategy was a, a co-opt and conquer strategy, right? So they weren't interested in really uh, assimilating with the Germanic people. That was just a way of butting up to them before they slid all their throats, right? So, I mean, they go in and they say, hey, you know what? We're a lot alike. 
you got Saturn, we have Saturn, you have, you know, all this kind of stuff. So, but then, I mean, the, the Druids are still going to be slaughtered, right? So it was mass extinction of the, of the Druids. It's not like they really respected the religion. This is a, a Roman kind of deal. I mean, Romans conquer, that's what they're good at. So the, the fact that they did the reboot for Christianity, I understand you don't have to go there or you don't go there and you don't have to go there. But to me, that seems totally in line with uh, w- what they always did, you know, it's a kind of the bait and switch, give them this, take it away. Uh, that's my take. Yeah, well, I mean, this is an interesting conversation, and it's not the area that I taught at the college level. So, you know, professionals in this area might take exception to the direction that we take it, but I might suggest that the Romans had an empire that was very successful because they did things slightly differently than some other empires, they were actually very syncretistic or syncretic uh, in that they would say to the, they weren't really the cut everyone's throat when we conquered you empire. Uh, certainly, right, right. certainly, I'm not suggesting they were cuddly and friendly. They were hardcore, very effective fighters, but they would generally say, hey, we'll set your gods up right here next to our gods. Um, they weren't necessarily evangelistic with their gods they were, like I said they would say oh you, you know well we correspond him with Hercules you want to have a or her with Venus you want to have a temple to Isis and actually you know the Isis mysteries became right. a big deal in Rome and that's really coming obviously from Egypt so um, it's really Christianity later on under in the time of what you're talking about the feudal system that was set up after Rome quote unquote fell, we could talk about that too. It was actually more convenient for these large families that now had lots of land to say, hey, let's get rid of these pesky emperors because emperors are a pain. They're constantly overthrowing one another and causing havoc and having all these intrigues and this emperor marches, this want, wannabe emperor marches in, gathers up a bunch of troops, marches in to attack the existing emperor and it just messes up our economy let's get rid of that emperor and we can have a much more lucrative system of collecting rents off of all this land that we've got so um (laughs) so i think that did happen we could you know i don't want to get too bogged down in it but i I don't want to get bogged down in it either because i I took us there but i made a note i mean this is a future skeptical episode (laughs) because i've I've had this floating around and you know certainly i had joseph atwell on the show a couple times and he feels like he's got this wired and that's exactly the way it is but there's another guest out there i'm not going to reveal who it is i think really has this wired as well and yeah, it's great. Everything, everything you said was great. It, but it is kind of a little bit off topic for all the amazing stuff that you have. So I'm going to back off here. And this is the Skeptico Jeopardy board. And you should pick where we go next, David. Great. Well, um, why don't we, just before we pick, we'll keep the listeners in a suspense for just a second. And there was another thing you said about academia. Um, having a hard time getting their arms around us. I forget exactly how you phrased it, but really I think it's in line with the Skeptico um, mission statement of exploring paradigms. How do paradigms change? You know, when when you say, oh, David has written so much, um, has written so many, I've written really over 5,000 pages of, of books, that you say it should be just proven. Now, some people might say, but wait a minute, how many pages of peer-reviewed papers has David published? And, I, and I'll tell you, I've sent in some academic-style papers. I know how to write an academic-style paper, and I've been politely told this isn't very interesting, or this doesn't exactly fit, or this is, and I'm like, what do you mean it doesn't exactly fit? This is right in your wheelhouse. But the problem is, if it is outside of the existing paradigm or if it threatens the existing paradigm, then it's going to meet with resistance, not necessarily conspiratorial resistance either, but you know, there are institutional types of um, resistance to where if I'm a, I've worked my way up through academia, through all these hurdles that I have to go through. And now I'm a tenured or nearly tenured professor. If I start talking about a paradigm that says there seems to be, a similar thing or even a common system being operated in ancient Egypt and 
the sacred stories of Australia, sacred stories of North America, or even sacred stories of the Norse, that causes problems. If I were to show maybe connections between the stars and the Greek myths and stay within that system, that might have some interest. But the minute you say this appears to be a worldwide system, that, ex that threatens to explode the existing paradigm. And, and what happens with paradigm, paradigms shift over time. We know this in science. We can see, let's say, plate tectonics introduced in 1906 by Alfred Wegener was ridiculed. And people said, there's no way that the, the continental, the floors underneath the sea could let those continents move around because they're all solid. Well, after World War II with increasing technology and submarine sensing, they said, oh, look at all these ridges on the bottom of the ocean. Maybe this theory finally in the 60s and 70s, it began to be, it began to be accepted. And what I would say about a paradigm is it will explain usually a lot of things, but there's always this like outlier. I call it the little bag of parts. This is a metaphor. If you've ever taken apart an engine or tried to fix something in your car engine and you put it all back together and you get a little Ziploc bag full of nuts and bolts that are left over, you know you didn't put it back together exactly right. You're like, whoops, where, how did all these things fit in there? Well, there are, these are like the anomalous evidence that shows that the paradigm is not put together completely right. And eventually someone will come along and say, you know, if we put it together this way, all those bolts would fall into place. All that anomalous evidence would fall into place. And this happens over and over, I would argue, in the world of paradigms, right? Hey, on the paradigm thing, I mean, that's, that's yeah. all well and good. And we got 250 shows. But I, wonder, I, would, agree. I, would, just, I would disagree okay, on a couple of fronts. I mean, number one, the, the, the fact that there's the paradigm change and it changes one funeral at a time is true in one sense. In another sense, there's an organized systematic effort on the part of certain individuals and they're different groups for different things, whether it's medicine, you know, they, they don't want the paradigm to change. There's economic interest often involved in this. So it's not like it's a fair game. It's not like everyone's trying to do their best out there. And it's just, you know, oh, I'm so, I'm so my, my ego of my thing. No, it's organized, right, right. controlled, it's systematic. And it, with right. regard to, with regard to this, latest thing i mean I, what amazes me and what has happened over and over again just on the recent episodes of skeptico i'll have guests on and they're fantastic guests and they've done all this research but you got to do this silly double talk kind of thing you got to say you know you've done great considering you've been in academia for 30 years and you gotta hold to some bullshit line i mean the last guest i had on gregory shishan you know same kind of thing, super, but you know, he's got to be very careful. He's got to talk in this, uh, you know, consider, we have to consider the postmodernist that no experience matters. It's like, no, we don't. It's totally freaking absurd. No one in their right mind would, would it, it wrap their head around these crazy ideas. Or the, the guy I talked to uh, before that in anthropology, same kind of thing. I have to carefully tread so carefully. So I don't even like to, it's, it's a, okay. this forced, we have this false equality when we say, oh, well, you know, we have to kind of give equal time to the consideration of these nitwits who won't let go of their theory. I don't want to go there. Okay, I hear your frustration there. And I'm not trying, I'm not in academia, so I'm not trying to not step on anyone's toes. I'm quite critical. But I would say there is, there's room to say there is probably venality at work in some cases, venal, venality, what I was just describing, you know, people who, they, well, I don't want my job to be threatened. And then there is also, I would, I would certainly grant you, and I'm, I'm certainly not shying away from the explanation of there's also conspiracy or conspiratorial interests at work, power interests, economic interests, big time power and economic interests, going all the way back to what we talked about with the Roman so I'm glad we touched on the Roman because that gave the that gave shape to the Western, basically the Western Roman Empire gave shape to Western Europe with which was controlled by large landholding families calling themselves noble or aristocrat, meaning I'm better, and the church. And those two were basically a revolving door back and forth between those two, and they controlled everything. And that's really, if you want to get into the left-right split it came out of 
France and the Enlightenment's um, attempts to try to, hey, let's try and improve on this feudal system. Let's get, let's get rid of this collect rent for just basically sitting back and, hey, I wonder, I wonder how much rent rolled in today from my lands. I, well, I need to go hunting. Uh, we'll see what the peasants send me today. And, and um, getting rid of that rent collecting system um, is still a struggle that's going on today. So, uh, but, but hold on. I mean, back to what we're talking about here in, in terms of academia kind of throwing the holy water on your work. Well, why? That's never going to happen. And, and I, I'd go further. Here I am. I think I'm kind of t defending your position, which I don't know how we got switched in roles here. But <laughs> no, no, like no, you no. said earlier, I mean, there is no there is no reasonable explanation on one hand. If you go to uh, uh, anthropology, there's no one who would say, yeah, those ancient Polynesians and the Mayans and the Romans and the Africans and the Norse, they all created these myths this way. No one says that, right? So there isn't some, when you say, oh, well, maybe, you know, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it's, a, no, let's not give them the benefit of the doubt. Based on everything they've published, based on what they've said, there's no way to explain the universality of these star myths. So the fact that they don't is we don't know how much of it is just ego, people holding on to their jobs and their work, or how much of it is the, the remnants of, hey, you know, that's kind of, we don't want to get into that esoteric wisdom because it opens up a big can of worms. But we don't know which of those two it is, but we know it's one of those two. We know there isn't any reasonable explanation on their part. They can't invent something new to fill that gap, right? Right. So no, this is great. And we're not, I don't think we're arguing against each other. I think we're... Uh building the point up from, uh, from the friction of our conversation, of our minds working on this question. So I would say, number one, my work certainly threatens the, the literalist Christian paradigm because it shows that, you know, what I said about the characters and events of the myths of the world being based on the stars can be shown with overwhelming amounts of evidence for the characters and events in the Bible, which has been even up to a couple hundred years ago, it was actually dominated academia to where you couldn't, you couldn't argue against, let's say, the flood as, uh, as described in the Bible or the age of the earth. And so there's a tremendous backlash that happened against that within academia. But anyway, this, this threatens that. But it also threatens, so you said, well, there's, no, there's nobody talking about all this because there's really no way to explain it within their current paradigm. There are ways to explain it, and we're gonna explore some of those. You could explain it by, well, it could be some kind of collective unconscious, that's what Jung said, or some kind of psychic connection, or it could be- That's, to that's totally off the table. We right, well, that's off the table because it- science. We have a materialistic science that doesn't acknowledge that. So because no, they've again, accepted I'm, gonna, a paradigm. I'm gonna hammer you on this. I'm gonna hammer you on this, because you're gonna oh, go yeah. far afield with all these different explanations. It, it's, I get into this all the time with, with my other stuff. Inside the paradigm, there's no way to explain this, period. Why do we have to try and let them back in the door? Well, here's what's happening. Uh, let me go back to my engine being put back together wrong metaphor. What I'm, throwing, what I'm holding up is not just a little bag of nuts and bolts. I'm holding up things like, here's a crankshaft. How do you, you forgot this. And they're like, yeah, but my paradigm is working. And I'm like, yeah, you're firing on three cylinders out of eight and it sounds awful and it gets terrible gas mileage. And they're like, don't mess with my engine. I'm moving forward down the road. And I'm like, you're on three cylinders. And Gobekli Tepe is another giant like drive shaft or flywheel that's been left, left off. Gobekli Tepe is 6,000 years at least compared to earliest dynastic Egypt. And it's beautifully precise stones aligned with celestial alignments, by the way, that throws a, a problem into the paradigm. But what I'm discovering, it doesn't throw a problem into what I'm discovering at all, because you could say, well, possibly the reason why this is dispersed all around the world is there's some very ancient civilizations or cultures that far predate Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia and Sumer, far predate Egypt, far predate ancient India, because all those cultures are already using this system. They must have come from something much more ancient 
nobody wants to consider something much more ancient that could also be advanced. So they say, no, wait a minute, that was only primitive humans or early humans, they call them. That'll mess up all our textbooks that show we basically lived in caves or we were pastoral or we were hunter gatherers and then poof, Egypt and Mesopotamia just spring out of the ground out of nowhere. And they would say, well, Dave, you're, you're, you're obviously, you're, you're exaggerating that a little bit. But basically they say that, yeah, we just all of a sudden, the, those cultures received what they had from somewhere probably far in, a, in the past. And that would help explain what's going on around the world. But that's also outside the paradigm. But the paradigm is going to have to change because Gobekli Tepe kind of recently, late 90s, early 2000s, threw a giant crankshaft into like, hey, how are you going to explain this? And, they, and, and so far the paradigm, the existing paradigm cannot incorporate it. And the existing paradigm has a problem with what I'm talking about too. And that's why it's almost like when somebody's paradigm is threatened, there's like blindness that actually sets in. If your wife is cheating on you and it will take over your whole world, your gut is going to know it before your mind admits it. You're going to actually be blind to the evidence while your gut is like, I know something's going on. And your mind is like, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to look over there. I'm not going to look over there. So, and I would say that when you're talking about conspiracy, that's going on in the United States right now. There's all kinds of evidence that people don't even want to look at. Well, that's um, always that's going on. always been the case. Got to move on. Next category. Right. So, uh, let's go to authentic self. <laughs> let's take Next. authentic self for 300. Okay, 300. That's very conservative, but I, I <laughs> like the pick. All right. So what I would argue, people might say, man, this I think I understand what he's saying, that all the myths are based on the stars, but why would they do that? And why would somebody want to get rid of that? I mean, I don't usually emphasize the conspiratorial part too much, but what I would argue is that the ancient wisdom that is given to the world, that is given to virtually every culture on the planet. Like I said, when I say I've written 5,000 pages, I'm not bragging. I'm saying there's so much evidence there that it's almost, it's almost hard to write a short book about it. My most recent book is 900 pages. I don't, you know, that's not really the way you market a book, but I wanted to show it all in one place. But when I say I've written 5,000 pages, the next sentence is, and I've only barely scratched the surface. Only barely scratched the surface. There's plenty of cultures I haven't even gotten to. There's plenty of stuff in one culture that could make 10 books. Even one book of the Bible, I could write a series just on the stories in Genesis in the connection to the stars, let alone the Mahabharat of ancient India, which is like seven times longer than the Odyssey and the Iliad combined. And it's all based on the stars, I would argue. And I've shown some of those connections. So when I say 5,000 pages and it's only scratched the surface, it's what I'm saying is every culture has this ancient wisdom. What was it doing and why was it based on the stars? Well, at this point, I've got some suggestions. I'm not going to be dogmatic. I can be dogmatic about the evidence and say, look, this constellation is clearly lining up with this and this and this. What it means, now we're getting into a little bit more of my interpretation. But after studying it for 10 years pretty intensively, I would argue that one of the things it's doing is conveying to us messages in an esoteric way like Mr. Miyagi taught Daniel-san and conveying profound messages to us, like Mr. Miyagi taught Daniel-san with wax on, wax off, something that seemed totally different from what he was actually teaching him was karate. Mr. Miyagi wasn't trying to hide karate from Daniel-san. He was trying to explain karate to Daniel-san, but it involved some things that were profound, that were invisible, so to speak, hard to grasp. And by the way, Daniel-san also came from, uh, he wasn't a very trusting individual because he'd been, he'd, he was a, a very doubting individual and he'd been burned a lot. He was, I might even argue, traumatized and isolated from who he really was. And, and uh, But David, the was, natural question that rises up is, yeah. who would do this yeah. And why, why would they do it in that way? Right. Right. So, because, so, because hold on, because you talk about this, I've heard so many 
interviews with you and we did yeah. an interview before and it seems like we get up to this point and we talk about all this great stuff and reintegrating with yourself and the twins and isn't that this uh, which fantastic stuff i'm all into that that's like, me man that's me non-dual spiritual seeker but what you're saying really begs these questions of who would do this in such a manner as this? Because if we accept your 5,000 pages, then mm -hmm. there was a, this is like a very human kind of teaching. You know, this uh, allegory with look at the stars. When you look up here, remember this story. And then this story, you should apply it this way. That's not a uh, thunderbolt, uh, near-death experience, voice of God kind of stuff. That's your second grade teacher kind of stuff. Who did this and why did they feel that it was important to teach in this way, this kind of perennial wisdom? Yeah, good. Obviously it was quote unquote, a Kung Fu master, but not a Kung Fu master, but it's like Mr. Miyagi, you had, Mr. Miyagi had to be a master. He already had to be, he had to have karate or Kung Fu or whatever he was teaching in his bones to such a degree that he could say, well, how can I teach this to this guy? I'll invent wax on, wax off. Uh, you already had to know profound things to come up with this system. Let me just say that. Now, when you say it's like second grade stuff, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe a lot of our problems started in our second grade age or earlier because look- That's a given, that's a okay. given. I'm just, uh, I don't wanna get off on that thing. Okay, I'm just saying in terms of these are not like uh, you know, quantum physics kind of stuff. This is kind of basic kind of stuff. So keep, keep going. But, okay. but I want you to also get what, you know, Mr. Miyagi is visiting all the, you know, you got to bring it back to the, to, to the profundity of the totally busting the paradigm and the crankshaft and thousands of researchers around the world who don't get it. I mean, make that connection. How do you have Mr. Miyagi going to all these different places? Right. So like I said before, I don't actually believe that you have to have a Mr. Miyagi figure or a, a Quetzalcoatl figure moving from continent to continent, distributing the same system. Uh, it could also be from a very ancient civilization or ancient culture. It could have been worldwide, could have been in one area. We don't know. That was wiped out or nearly wiped out by a cataclysm. And there's plenty of evidence on our planet for cataclysms, whether they're solar flares, like Professor Robert Schock argues for solar activity could actually make the whole ground radioactive for decades where people have to actually live underground. Could have been some kind of impact from some sort of object in outer space, like Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson have been talking a lot about recently, that caused the remnants of that cataclysm who had their memory of all this very profound and advanced, and maybe they were also technologically advanced. I mean, we see all these giant stones all around the world. And then they, they had to basically live underground for a long time, and then they repopulated or spread around. And over the thousands of years, the stories changed in different climates. Like you said, <laughs> the Norse myths have a very different feel from the myths of the Pacific or the myths of ancient India, and they're living in a very different climate. That's part of the reason why, but they had a different culture and different landscape that they were in and different so their gods took on a different flavor but an explanation could be instead of someone going around horizontally traveling in a, a boat across the oceans that they all descend like from a tree from some ancient predecessor source that's now forgotten and that potentially was wiped out or nearly wiped out by some kind of cataclysm but let me also go back to your point about well this is simple second grade stuff i would say look this is profound mastery stuff let me just say, we're living in a culture that is severely traumatized. So we haven't got this figured out. If we've got millions of people dying from addiction, that's because you're separated from your authentic self is what the, the, the psychologists and psychiatrists like Dr. Gabor Mate, Dr. Peter Levine say, look, I dealt with addicts in downtown East Vancouver for decades, and I never met one single addict who did, wasn't traumatized as a child. I never met one single female who came into my clinic who wasn't actually sexually abused as a child. So trauma 
the, the, the modern definition of psychological trauma is actually separation from your authentic self. And maybe some people are tuning out and saying, well, just a minute, I wasn't traumatized. The society we have that came from that society that stamped out all this ancient wisdom is a society that traumatizes you, whether it's on purpose, conspiratorial, or just the way it got set up, it traumatizes people. And even if you didn't experience, I would say almost everybody experiences trauma, but if the ancient myths are talking about reconnecting with your authentic self, then it must be even part of the human condition that we lose connection with our authentic self. And I would say that's not, that'd be great if you learn how to connect with your authentic self as a second grader, but I would say there are CEOs of corporations, successful billionaires who get paid you know, $300 million a year who are separated from their authentic self. So this isn't a small problem. This is a huge issue. That's why people take yoga or get into meditation because they're trying to find their authentic self. And I would say the myths are part of that ancient system to point us on how to reconnect with their authentic self. So it's like a huge issue and it'd be great if you learned it by second grade. But a big part of the problem is we're all still struggling with that. That's what I would say. Well, <laughs> how's that? Does that, I mean, let, we can get into why. I'm all about authentic self. Okay. I'm all about reconnecting with my authentic self. I'm all about the non-dual path, which is the authentic self in yoga, right? So it's like there is the you and then there's the outside, the doer, and you are not that. But this is my personal kind of 24-7 spiritual path kind of thing. But what interests me and is challenging to me as well is that we have to connect that with the, the world that we live in. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting about the traumatization is we live in a world, you are part of the, <laughs> or your culture from the beginning. And I mean, you're going to have to deconstruct that in a way that we can understand it. But you were in the military, you served, and then you taught. And there is an ultimate truth to what I have up on the screen. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. It's real, right? So one that's real is that I live in my phony baloney lifestyle because someone else has taken care of that messy killing people around the world to quote unquote, keep me safe. And if I don't like that, and I don't like the way they're doing that, then I can do it a different way. But history isn't very kind to people who aren't aggressively protecting their right to exist. Moreover, when you talk about trauma, forget the, the, that for a second and take about the what, what I've heard people say, we live by the descendants of people who engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat and murder on a mass scale. They were the winners, right? So the, whether it's the Vikings that came in there and just mass killed everybody or uh, Genghis Khan, who, you know, every, or the Romans, you know, behead the uh, 10 heads and leave one a lot. I mean, we are the descendants of these mass murders. So there's, there's enough trauma there. So I'm just not comfortable with quickly putting all the pieces together because of the Gemini constellation uh, has some esoteric wisdom that we all should have gotten on from the beginning. Okay, interesting. Lots of, uh, lots of stuff to dive into. So let me talk about, you, talk, you talked about we're all in society and therefore, you know, we all get a bunch of stuff laid on us, whether you went into that particular part of society, like the military. Yeah, I graduated from West Point. They use some, they use some stress based, uh, stress based training during beast barracks and plebe year. And, and, uh, you know, I could, we could spend the rest of the time talking about funny, quote unquote, funny stories of stuff that they do to you when they're screaming in your face. I graduated from Ranger School. <laughs> I graduated from Airborne School. I graduated from the 82nd Airborne's Jump Master School. Um, that's a particular part of society that lays a grid on your brain even more heavily maybe than other uh, societal pursuits that people could engage in. But the connection with society is part of what separates us from our authentic self. And I'll go all the way back to the very earliest record, very earliest human record that we have is the Gilgamesh, well, the Mesopotamian clay tablets that were found in the library of Ashurbanipal, 
contain the Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh epic. And in there, you've got Enkidu and Gilgamesh, who are almost twins. But Enkidu is this wild man. He lives out in nature among the animals. He's naked. He's covered with hair. And Gilgamesh is the king, and he's two-thirds divine. And Enkidu lives among the wild animals, and he's connected with the wild animals until he gets entangled with society. And the first part is through sexual intercourse with the temple prostitute Shamhat. You see, the, the king is approached and said, hey, there's a wild man out in the woods. And Gilgamesh says, no problem. Just take this beautiful temple prostitute Shamhat out there. Once she sleeps with him, the animals won't want anything to do with him. And in fact, he'll get tangled into society and he'll, he'll become one of us, which is exactly what happens. And that myth, that most ancient tablet that we have, shows Enkidu, after he sleeps with her, he finds the animals run away from him. He no longer has strength in his legs to keep up with them. <laughs> like uh, in the Rocky movie, uh, Mick says, women ruined legs, rock, <laughs> stop that. So <laughs> that's what happens to Enkidu. He's like, hmm, I'm not the same man I was before, but now I'm getting a haircut like Samson. I'm starting to eat bread and wine. Hmm, where have I heard that in other myths before? That's the first thing that is, he's given. Uh, some people say, well, it's bread and beer. doesn't matter. It's the same constellations. This is all related to constellations. But what it's showing is once you're connected with society, you can't go back to the state of nature. You, you, Enkidu can't go back to being, to, you can't undo. It's like they said after we've invented the atomic but bomb. But isn't that connecting back. with ourself, connecting with our authentic self is going back, is the journey back. So it's actually a journey, yes. But it's not... Back to Enkidu doesn't end up where he was before. He meets up with Gilgamesh. And actually, I would argue that Gilgamesh and Enkidu are not two people. Castor and Pollux, one twin is divine, one twin is mortal. They're not two people. It's like in, I, I've been lately using the Lord of the Rings, Gandalf the Grey, before he falls with the Balrog and Gandalf the White, they're not two people, but he's different afterwards. And Gilgamesh and Enkidu, they become so close that they're as close as a husband and a wife is what it says. And, and modern academia says, oh, good, we can talk about homoerotic uh, ancient literature. I would say it's not homoerotic ancient literature. I'm not, I'm not saying you can't see that in, in literature, but it's actually two, two sides of one person. That's why the Bible says there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. It's closer than a brother because it's in you. You have to refine your authentic self and your mind. You, you showed some pictures of like Yogananda and meditation. Your mind is not you. It's part of you. It's a tool, but it can run away with you. It can trick you. Your mind has to be put in its place. Like my dog, you know, thinks it owns the house. And when a male man comes up with a package, my dog thinks he has to defend the house. And I have to say, hold on. You don't own the whole house. Go sit over there. That's what your mind does. Your mind is this defense mechanism that you've developed because you live in society. And that defense mechanism... Right, but you know, we could... Th there are over. thousands and thousands of people and teachers who've spent millions and millions of hours trying to instruct people mm -hmm. about these very things. You know, yeah. this is the non-dual path. This is the the monkey mind, sometimes That's they right. call it in India. Now, the, the problem with that is, you know, we are going to get really particular because I, I do, I do pronoun for you, you are on the path and I am on my own path. We can all only take this path ourselves. So I wouldn't agree with the language. I don't try and uh, uh, boss my mind around or wrestle with my mind or try and control my mind. I don't think that works, but mm -hmm. that's a particular understanding I have of my spiritual path and, and how I do it. What I'm trying to really get to is trying to understand that in relation to what you're talking about in the star myth. So, you know, David, you don't have to convince me that, <laughs> number one, the star myth hypothesis is real. You don't have to convince me that it's hidden in plain sight from academic stick in the muds who this totally blows their world away. You don't have to convince me that there is an perennial 
esoteric wisdom that talks about returning to our authentic self. What you do have to convince me about is, wait, I got a great, I got a great picture for it. Let me pull it up. No, I already did that. Hold on. That it ain't aliens. You know, <laughs> okay. it's like I got up on the screen. I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. Okay. So, but you wait, know, we, Alex, we have, you we, jumped ahead to a new topic before you let me address some of the stuff you said at the start of this, where you said, I don't believe you have to boss it around, or that's not how it works for my mind. When did I ever say you have to boss around? No, okay, I said my dog. I put him calmly in his place. That's like when you're meditating. Look, those spiritual teachers that you're referring to, they use... My teacher never taught meditation. Okay. Okay. Two well, of my teachers a, never taught meditation. I think meditation... Because you know what? Because you know what? You, like, <laughs> so we could get into this whole thing. Like yeah. I heard you say, I'm yoga. I've done yoga for 35 years, right? Yeah. So I understand. I go sit in an ice bath six days a week at 35 <laughs> degrees temperature to remind me that I'm not my mind, you know? Yeah. You have all sorts of disciplines. You're a freaking ranger, you know what I mean? <laughs> you understand the kind of things that you do. But I don't accept that as really being part of my path. If I was... If I was better, I wouldn't have to sit in that freaking ice bath to remind myself, but I'm kind of stupid. So I have to go there and go, oh, okay, I'm not my body and my mind can yammer away and it doesn't matter. So we're going to talk, that, that, that whole discussion is like this, you know, we could have a heart to heart three hour personal discussion about how we have our own conception of our mind and how it works. So please, I. Okay. But before we go to aliens, I just want to say, look. And I'm not prescribing any one path. I'm saying, look, the ancient world had meditation. It had drumming. It had breath control, which I'm sure you do when you get into the ice baths. It had uh, martial arts. And it had myths. You don't have to use, you can become, you can rediscover your authentic self by many different paths. And you don't have to use the myths either. There's probably plenty of masters of men and women who have, recovered their authentic self and never used the myth. But I'll tell you that those teachers, the yoga teachers, like um, the Ashtanga story of Patanjali, talks about him having serpent coils, uh, and coming down <laughs> and having coils of a serpent, serpent-like. It's mythical. It's actually related to constellations. We could go into that myth. But the, the, the myths don't tell you to yell at your or order your monkey mind around because you're absolutely right it'll just get stronger if you do that. if i yell at my dog he'll bark at me even worse but it shows this in pictures like in the bhagavad gita where arjun and his divine charioteer krishna are getting ready to go into this battle of kurukshetra arjun is seized by doubt and wants to withdraw just like doubting thomas and jesus or just like in the story of eros and psyche Psyche has all these doubts and she loses her connection with Eros in this ancient Greek myth. And, the, and Thomas, Jesus doesn't restore Thomas by yelling at him and saying, what a crappy disciple you are. You're the worst one. You were so full of doubt. And, and Krishna doesn't restore Arjun from his doubts in the Bhagavad Gita by saying, you're fired, Arjun. You're not even going to be in this battle. I'll handle it. He restores him. The way he restores him helps us to understand the relationship, the proper relationship between our higher self or our authentic self and our egoic mind. Our egoic mind is full of doubts because it's racing ahead into the future or into the past and going all over the place. And our, our authentic self is just who we really are. It's our essence. It's and our it, be here now mind. I, right. I get that. It's the and so, and so what I'm saying is the myths show that in pictures and Great. it's extremely so the helpful. Myths show that in pictures. I don't disagree with you. Some people relate to <laughs> allegory. Some people relate to myths. I, I, I relate to this in very simple logical terms. You are not what you observe. Anything you observe, that can't be you. You must be something else. Uh-oh light bulb goes off, there's another part of me that I didn't realize, non-dual part. So, it, 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 hey, myths are great, stories are great, you know, uh, all the, throughout all the, I mean, the link that I think you're making that is important here is that you've done this exhaustive, uh, important chronicling of these star myths and how they're connected to all these uh, 
ancient civilizations, it is not at all surprising to me that those myths correspond to spiritual teachers, past, present, and current, yeah, present, I guess is current, current teachers who are saying the same thing from their personal experience. They're not saying, oh, this was passed on to me. They're saying, no, I sat here, I meditated, I came to this realization, and the realization matches completely with what you're saying the myths say. So to me, again, we're... <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'm taking too much of an no, tone here. But my point is, that's the point that interests me. You don't have to teach me about authentic self-integration kind of thing. I mean, like I say, I'm 24-7. Tell me wh why, where that's coming from, wh who and why these star myths that we can date back that far, why they exist. And you maybe you felt like you handled that when you said, you sit in a place where you say, there was some ancient civilization and they wanted to do that. I would then even ask, see, but then that generates to me an interesting question. Why would they, why would they do that? Because at the same time, you know, if you really look at the, some of the evidence that's come up about Mars, right? it looks like from a number of different points of reference here. One being the remote viewing of Joe McMonagle, who I think is like one of the top remote viewers in the world. Uh, you know, secret spy number 000. And then I just interview Courtney Brown, who's currently a remote viewer, both same thing independently, remote view Mars, ancient civilization, maybe our ancestors. And then I got John Brandenburg, who I interviewed, and he says, hey, I take it from a physicist standpoint, ancient traces hundreds of millions of years ago of a nuclear explosion on Mars that has all the signatures of a bomb. So <clears throat> I just throw that out because it establishes another data point. There is the potential that there are some ancient civilizations that are off planet. There's one that's close by. And, and that, that comes up over and over again. I had a slide up there of the Dogen, right? So you go talk to the Dogen, but you can talk to all sorts of star uh, uh, indigenous people. And I just had an expert on, and they're all saying the same thing. Star people, star people, star people. They came and they passed on this wisdom. So if you want to say that you stand apart from that and say, no, I don't go there. I don't think that's necessary. I think it could have been an ancient civilization that was Atlantean and was buried under the rocks for 30,000 years. Fine. I just want to know what you think about that. Cause to me, it seems that all the evidence points towards alien visitation, alien genetic engineering, alien passing along intelligence, but then that, that raises a bunch of questions too. All right. <laughs> so once again, um, I do want to get to the thing that you ended with, but the thing that you said at the beginning, at the very beginning of this, question that you're framing, you said, I got it. I'm 24 seven. So you don't have to convince me about connection with the authentic self. But I would say this ties into the whole story. And we'll get to aliens in a second. Um, it ties in because we are not living in a society, I would say, these myths were given to uplift men and women, prevent oppression, prevent tyranny, there are people who would argue with me about that and say, no, these myths are meant to bind you into religion. But hold on. So, okay. Yeah, good. I think they're there to uplift people. It's great that you're 24 seven, but there also has to be a societal component. We want to uplift others as well. Or we, we should at least be saying, wait a minute, half of the 101 and at the off ramp, I see tent after tent after tent of people who are homeless. What's going on? Uh, um, the, there's our society is not we're not all 24 7 reconnecting with our authentic self our society is actually engineered to disconnect you from your authentic self so you're looking for solutions outside of yourself by consuming this or buying that or maybe the next person i date will will solve my problems and, and it's outside of you and we're endlessly rushing after a a, a solution that's outside. But David, of a lot of people are going to point to you and say, what are you talking about? You are part of this military oh, industrial yeah. complex that has us dominating the world and living our phony baloney lifestyle by basically oppressing everyone else in the world. And that's what we've done. Now you want to stand apart from that? I mean, I, I don't know. 
<laughs> I'm certainly not in the military right now, and I wasn't uh, one of the guys at the top. I tell you that. They I'm a part of it. I'm a part of it. And I was never in the military, right. but I don't want to give up everything. You know, by by virtue of the fact that we don't want to give up what we have, I, I just that's a whole other discussion. And when you start talking about societal changes, there are a group of people who always stood aside and said, you guys can go play whatever game you want with this world. I am not, I am in this world, but I'm not of that world. That's the only thing that makes sense for me. Cause as soon as you want to start going, handing out money to people in tents, then you got a bunch of other people. I mean, I, I don't know how you solve that problem. If you want to go there, Let's go there, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. We can go there, but let's, let's go back to the military point. There's a proper use for the military. There's a proper use for strength, violence, or force, and swords and spears, and now we have rifles and other things. And that's to protect people, protect the weak. If I am protecting other people, if, if someone is about to be raped or murdered, and I come in and stop them, that's a proper use of force. If I'm using it to go around and rape and murder people, that's an improper use of force. And I would draw a distinction between those two things. And when I was in the military, I thought that the U.S. Army was for defending democracy, peace, and freedom. By the way, I had not yet learned all I've learned about the myths. In fact, I hadn't even started down this path when I got out of the Army. And I'll tell you that what I've learned about the myths have changed a lot of the things I believe. I was a literalist Christian at that time. I'm no longer a literalist Christian. I no longer believe that the military is being used for defending peace and freedom and democracy around the world. If you want to go there, we can go there. But the military is not being used to protect this country. It's being used to take over other countries and take their resources. Afghanistan is not going to invade us, and yet we've been there for 18 years. But what I'm saying is I don't disagree. I don't deny that there's a proper role for force and militaries. My favorite of the ancient myths is probably the Odyssey. Odysseus was a badass fighter, right? But Odysseus, we see in that, we see in that epic, we actually see into his mind, we see his mind running away from him at certain points where he starts to panic. And then Athena shows up and inspires him. And he stops panicking and gets back to the moment and actually survives. And, and time after time in that book, he would have perished when he met Circe. He would have perished when he met Scylla and Charybdis. He would have perished when he went down into the underworld all these different times, but he had help from Hermes or help from Athena. What is that? So I'm saying if you want to be a better basketball player at the top of your game or a better, you know, any human endeavor, martial arts or military arts, you, you will do better if you're higher mind or your authentic mind and your egoic mind that is able to go into the future and the past are in harmony and you will you will be able to realize your potential better now what do you do with that potential hopefully you do things like defending the weak and helpless rather than uh, oppressing the weak and helpless so i think there's there's an individual component and there's a societal component so i didn't want to i didn't want to leave that behind when you were saying hey, this is all great and we're in agreement that we should be working on, you know, ice baths or whatever it is that helps you get into touch with your authentic self. I totally agree with that, but I also don't think that we should, as you said, drop out from society completely and say, well, that's great. I'm reaching enlightenment to heck with the guys who are... Um, I'm saying you can do that, I'm, but I am saying you can do that. I'm saying, yeah. you know what, become more godlike and everything takes care of itself. You mm. don't have to get into figure out what would Jesus do. Just become like Jesus and then you will do like Jesus. You don't need to figure it out. You don't need to figure out how to solve the homeless problem or how to solve geopolitical problems. You don't need to do any of that. Just be a better uh, you and then you will act accordingly and however you act, you know, whether you're like, uh, you know, my good friend, uh, Rick Artrip, Buddhist Gaspump, who does a show with 500 shows with spiritual teachers, but can't wrap his head around the climate change scam and how that's just designed to eliminate rights and take rights away. So if you're a lot, an alarmist like he is, or if you're like I am and take more kind of, hey, I don't know why they're playing this game. I don't know why they did 9-11. I don't know why they did the, the coup that was the Kennedy assassination. I don't know why the pedophile rings, you know, and the blackmail rings. 
I don't know that. I don't want to close my eyes from it, pretend it doesn't exist. I agree with you on the military thing. Our best hope is the U.S. Navy commercials, a force for good. That's our best hope, is to hold to that ideal. Even if it's not true, even if we know it's bullshit, we have to say, you know what, we had some guys back a couple hundred years ago that founded this country, they had some pretty damn good ideas. And they were like, everyone just has their own rights and then they'll do the right stuff. And, you know, so I'm just saying, uh, I, don't, I don't buy the leap to, you know, trust me on all, because this has been used to exploit people and manip manipulate people and create cults is, hey, don't you agree with everything I'm saying about your authentic self? Now what we're going to do is this social movement. No, pause. I'm glad you're going there, Alex, because you're clearly, and, and you asked me the last time, and you mentioned it when you talk about Joseph Atwell, the word PSYOP, right? You've used that word PSYOP, and our cults were the cults that suddenly popped up a PSYOP, meaning were they more than just an organic cult that just popped up? Was it possible that there were agencies that were giving some of those cult leaders cover, like telling the police, well, don't arrest that guy out in the desert who's firing off machine guns, uh, you know, and the police are like, why not? He's firing off machine guns. Well, I don't know, but someone higher up said, don't touch him. And then it turns out it was Charles Manson and, and the family. Hmm. What's up with that? So the cults actually is an interesting point because what I told you about the higher self in the, the psyche, when Eros restores psyche, he doesn't destroy psyche. The cults are like, you need to get rid of your, your mind. <laughs> you need, they're, they're, they're a subtle distortion or, or twisting of, of what the ancient myths are trying to do. Instead of uplifting you, they're actually trying to turn you into a, a slave. But, and you mentioned Kennedy and all these things. I'm not sure if you were saying that just if you get in touch, maybe you were posing this as an argument that others do, um, that others do that you think is a false argument. Well, if I get in touch with myself, that's the best I can do and society will take care of itself. And I would say there's a societal component to it that we as citizens, men and women, can say to our government, yes, look, I, sw I swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I'm totally dialed into the Constitution of the United States, but I'll tell you that things that are going on, like the invasion of your privacy when your iPhone is listening to you or Facebook is writing down your conversations <laughs> is, an, is a violation of the Constitution of the United States. And Facebook as a corporation gets certain privileges from the government, such as limited liability, such as a corporate charter. And the people of the United States can say, you know what? I don't really like corporations taking all my data and listening to every single thing I say. I don't think that's right. Congress representatives in Congress, please pull their corporate charter or take away their limited liability because that's extended by society. And when you have a, when you have a predator like Jeffrey Epstein allowed out on the streets for decades and preying upon the weakest, uh, you know, young girls who are under the age of consent. So there's no, there's no, uh, uh, hiring of a prostitute. That's what he was quote unquote convicted for in 2008. There's no, you can't have a prostitute who's 14, 15, or 16 because they're under the age of consent in Florida where this happened. So citizens can say, hey, I meditate or I dunk myself in an ice bath and I get in touch with my authentic self. But at the same time, I demand that the social contract is the reason we have police and military and allow them to have machine guns when I'm not allowed to have an M60 in my house machine gun. They get to have it. Why? Because of the social contract. And part of that social contract is keeping predators off the street. And if I see evidence that there's like predators being protected and allowed, then I think as citizens, you also have to get involved in that and demand. Just a minute. I demand that my 14 year old daughter be protected from pedophiles. Is that too much to ask? No, it's not. <laughs> I don't know. All so, I'm saying, it though, is, I guess my point was. And I mean, this is kind of the world here that we're talking about. I mean, everything in the world is coming up in this conversation. And that's why I keep trying to bring it back to star myths, because that's your thing. Because, yeah. like, I can't, 
tell people how to process all the stuff that you just processed? Because I sound like just another idiot old man with a bunch of opinions that are different from anyone else's opinion. What I can relate to about what you're saying is anyone who is on the journey, is on the spiritual journey, is on connecting with their authentic self, will organically come to the right positions. But I, I have to tell you, I know people who are on that path and they come to some pretty weird conclusions that are very different than the conclusions I did. And all I can say is, I pranam to you, my man, because you know what, that journey, I don't know where it's taking you, but that person, whoever they are, clearly you're on that journey. So uh, I I don't know, this gets into the nature of evil question, which I, I think is related to these questions that we've been talking about. I mean, that's a question that is in, interesting to me. I won't say it's important to me because I have some pretty fixed understandings of that. But who and why, in terms of the myth, ancient myths, the who and why are the big questions to me. And then w- what is the relation between that force, that energy, that knowledge, and the evil? Because we do see evil. So, you know, Jeffrey Epstein, yada, yada. We talked about him forever. I I go back, I had an FBI agent on who infiltrated uh, NAMBLA. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because Jeffrey Epstein is too easy for people to kind of relate to. And yeah, him and Trump ran around and they picked up some young girls and maybe they were too young. No, go to NAMBLA. Go to NAMBLA where they trade in four-year-old boys, three-year-old girls, And then when they're done, they trade them off and then they make films and then they ultimately kill them in in a lot of cases. So uh, the reason I even go there is not to kind of shock people or anything like that is to say, if you have any doubts about the existence of each evil, I won't even go to the nature of evil, but the existence of evil, then that kind of brings you, oh, okay, I, I get it. That is of a different ilk. That isn't just something that we can easily understand. That is a force that we do see over and over again. So what is the relationship between that force and the perennial wisdom of the, of the myths? That's the kind of stuff I'm interested in. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason I raised the Jeffrey Epstein issue was to say, was to point out that you can't there's nobody who could argue that if I just get in touch with my higher self, whether I do it through meditation, drumming, ice baths, yoga, or whatever method, then predators will, will be kept off the street. What I'm saying is you've got to have a social component as well as a self-improvement component. Because if I just worry about self-improving and think that that's going to somehow stop horrendous systematic traumatization of children by NAMBLA or Jeffrey Epstein, then, I'm, then you're wrong. So but It gets tricky. Some people will even tell you that in the grander spiritual scheme of things, including reincarnation and souls, that there is some contract and this is all playing out in a way that we don't completely understand. So that the victims and the perpetrators are uh, actors changing roles. Now, I don't get into that. I don't uh, uh, endorse that belief, but I, I think there's an element of that that is somewhat undeniable, even when we look at our own history and how things emerge for us and stuff like that. So the only thing I'd say with that is, you know, again, I'm treading lightly when someone says, you know, grab the pitchforks and the torches because God is on our side on this one. It's more like, you know, everyone's on a journey and I wouldn't want to be Jeffrey Epstein and facing his near-death experience or his after-death experience and his life review where he feels the emotions and the, 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 the feelings that he's inflicted on other people. I wouldn't want to be that guy right now. But beyond that, in terms of, you know, how I balance all the, the, the massive scales, I don't know how to do it. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up because if, if like you said, the God is on our side, if if you're, I would argue that if you're using your beliefs to justify the uh, if, in violation of other people's rights, then that's a form of mind control. If you're saying, well, we can overlook 
the abuse and traumatization of those young children, sexual abuse, physical abuse, because of this passage in this scripture or that belief, then you're twisting it. Because the, the, the ancient myths show that the gods work their will out through men and women. That Men and women are precious. Every single person is. So if you're using it to violate the rights of someone else, you're turning it upside down. And that's what I think actually happened with the imposition of literalist Christianity and wiping out the ancient, ancient beliefs in Europe, starting with the Greek and Roman gods, but as you said, proceeding to the Druids, then working their way up to the Norse myths, and then starting to jump the ocean and saying, oh, we better stamp out all the beliefs of the Maya. We better stamp out the beliefs of the North American, Native American nations. We better stamp out what's going on in the Pacific Islands. This has been a stamping out in order to excuse and justify. Well, see, I would say that the gifts of the earth, like oil that's under the earth, the ancient Greeks would say, well, that's a gift of Pluton or Hades. Everything under the earth, all the riches of the earth are given to that nation, those people that were allowed to be born there by the gods. And if I'm an oil company and I say, I want to drill in your country, and the people of that country say, great, that'll be 30% tax to us for the riches of the gods that you're taking out. And the oil company says, hey, politicians, could you take care of these pesky guys in that country who are saying that we have to pay a 30% tax to them? Oh, no problem. We'll get our guy installed in there. He'll collaborate with us. We'll get that tax down to 2%. And if there's any pesky peasants in the way of where you want to drill, we've got ways of moving them out of the way too. So, so I think this is actually all related the, the, to the, <laughs> all these issues. But if you're excusing, look, we've created a society that traumatizes people. And you just told me about a group that systematically traumatizes people, or we have this Epstein character who is systematically traumatizing people. I'm saying you've got less resistance from the people if they're all traumatized. You've got less ability for the constitution to work and for self-rule to, to stop predators if everybody's traumatized. So I'm not denying, far from it, that there's conspiracy type stuff involved in what I'm talking about. The traumatization of the world by literalist Christianity is a topic. They basically slaughtered all the Native Americans. They justified slavery and said, well, yeah, you know. But David, we're, we're talking about the whole world now. Yeah, you know? yeah. So we're going to get over to China and we're going to talk about the chai craziness, right? Which is worse in, in a lot of respects. I don't want to go to China right now. I don't want, to be, I don't want chai to to run things. They don't have a literal, literalist Christian interpretation. They jumped on the other bandwagon and are doing the atheistic uh, uh, communist bullshit. You know, I mean, so to me that I, I don't, I don't get the connection that you're, that you're making there. No, that's okay. Without getting well, back to the, without getting back to the, the question that I'm asking is, no, no, okay, no. who are they? Why are they here? And what's their connection with yeah. evil? Okay. So let me go to the, let me go to the aliens. You know, you put up the interesting picture of, Giorgio Tsoukalos there, and I've met him at uh, Contact in the Desert. And The point on the alien thing is that uh, all, there's a ton of evidence that points in that direction. So well, you, don't you, have to go there. you don't have to go there, but you can't deny that there's just a ton of evidence. You know, part of your thing is that, and this is like another minor point, but it's one that I'd like to hear you com comment on. We all understand that people are in Stonehenge and they're looking up at the stars. We get that. But one of the, like, it's a little detail point. It's a David Matheson point. They weren't just looking at the stars. They were looking at the constellations, right? So constellations don't mean anything. There's no independent meaning of the constellations. Why do they build these megalithic structures to look at constellations? Well, because the constellations, as you're telling us, have meaning. Well, that, that's, that kind of changes the whole thing, right? Because when you hear the kind of standard tripe about uh, Stonehenge, it's like, well, that's, you know, lunar eclipse and all. That. No, all that goes out the window as soon as you say, no, they were aligning with constellations. Same thing with the Giza pyramids, right? 
Orion, the, right? It, oh music. my God, they That's line right. up Orion. Why that? And the other image I have up here is the Dogen, right? So you yeah. go to the Dogen people and they say, yeah, well, we did that because the star people, Sirius, came down and told us that. So we have all this stuff that lines up and it all points in the same direction, ancient aliens, and then you, you seem super resistant to going there. Why? Yeah, so I'm not actually resistant to going there. So you, people can go to my blog and search for Dogen and find blog posts I've written about the Dogens, more than one, the Dogen people, more than one blog post. And people can go and search on my blog for ancient aliens and find not just blog posts, but videos I've made about it. So here's why. Because I would argue that star people or these encounters don't necessarily equal extraterrestrials. I'm not ruling that out as a possibility. If I'm an investigator, if I'm Sherlock Holmes, I don't go into the investigation saying, well, I'm going to rule out the possibility that the butler did it. And I'm not also going to rule out the possibility that the police might be in on it. I'm going to have all those options open. But I'll tell you that what I think is possible is that all this amazing correspondences that we're talking about, the connections to the stars around the world, and the megalithic monuments. I mean, first of all, the building of the Great Pyramid, they're slinging around some big blocks, and there's still controversy as to how those blocks got put up at those heights because the ramps would have to be twice as big as the pyramids if it was ramps. But not only that, like you said, they're perfectly aligned, almost perfectly aligned north, south, east, and west, and there are alignments with the shafts to certain stars, and there's even this is a mind blower, proportional relationships between the size of our spherical earth and the size of the Great Pyramid. And, peop and people who are skeptical of that might say, yeah, Dave, there's proportions between your house and the size of the spherical earth. We just have to find the right uh, <laughs> number to divide by and we'll get the proportion. Yeah, but they're proportional to the size of the earth by the number 43,200, which is a precessional number which relates to the precession of the equinoxes, the precession of the stars, and takes, it's very hard to even figure out the precessional constant. It takes years and years. But I still don't understand why you don't accept ET. You, you kind okay. of brush past the point of, well, I, don't accept, I don't accept because, ET. It, it's because, like the evidence is, is overwhelming now. We right. have, so we have the DOD videos of these aircraft, right. and I had the guy on, the, the UFOs. I don't know how people get to UFOs and accept that there's UFOs that do these things we can't, do that, that a human being can't do and that they're powered by somebody but it's you won't go to et i, I got diane pasolka i doc valet who's no stranger in the head jock valet on the show you know jock valet th throws that stuff out there well, and and that's great but well, that's just kind of one. automatically equal look x Amazing craft doesn't automatically equal extraterrestrial. Now I'm not saying fill in that gap. That fill in that it. gap. Then amazing okay. craft from th for throughout history. You know Bob Lazar, who now has come out and and did that fantastic movie. And he says, yeah, you know, here's the craft. We had it at Area 51. Here's how we studied it. Here's how I understood the propulsion to work. I had on Diana Pasolka, uh, who you know is a PhD. A, a, a teacher she goes out in the desert she finds the craft pieces because a guy goes and shows her and there's all these kind of invisible college that knows all this stuff is going on i just had maria rodwell on last week who is a counselor for 30 years and helps people talk about traumatized helps people who are traumatized by their contact experience so you know unless you want to just take all that and pack it up in a box and just throw it all away then you got a big problem if you don't accept ET. That this idea that people throw around, they just throw out Jacques Vallée and they're like, okay, so now I can I can go on like ET doesn't exist and it's all uh, fairies again. I, no, you you can't. Hey, this is great. So I see you're passionate about this, Alex. Let me tell you. Let me ask you this: Would you discount the possibility that some of the UFO hype and activity after World War II was a PSYOP. Can that be considered as a possible explanation for some of it? Because let me tie it back to the myths. 
Hold on, so hold on. You asked the question, let me answer it. Of course, everything is a psyop. Everything okay, right. is, is a control. But what I just hit you with there is the physical evidence. So you might not like Diana Walsh Basulka. I'm not Everyone calling, does. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not but saying. She went out in the desert and she finds these pieces <laughs> of a craft and they go yeah. analyze it and they say that. And you've mentioned Jacques Vallée. I had Jacques Vallée on. You know yeah. what he's really interested in? The same thing. She's friends with, uh, with, Walsh Basoka is friends with, and he's interested in craft, right? So th there's no doubt that, that that's real. So the whole, is there PSYOP? Is there Project Blue Book? Was it a complete cover-up? Did they reach some point? Here's what the, the history that I think reveals is that, hey, they were surprised when all this stuff happens back in the 40s, like, whoa, so they're just kind of releasing it. And then they're at a, a junction where they have to go, okay, which way do we go? Do we just kind of do the mind control thing, like which relates to the star myth thing, and just go squash it and just go misinform and just deny, deny, misinform, misinform. Do we go that route? Or do we go this route of kind of embracing it and trying to understand it? Well, we know what route they went to and they just went the misinformation route. But that doesn't take away from the, where we're at today. We know that there's a reality. The Occam's razor is that there's a reality to it. You can imagine all sorts of things, but the evidence is overwhelming that that's the reality. Let me bring my area of expertise into it, Alex, since, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not, I haven't talked to Jacques Vallée. The reason I brought him up was because he says UFOs does not necessarily equal ET, at least not in every case. That's why I brought him up. But setting Jacques Vallée aside, I'm not relying on the authority of Jacques Vallée. Let me talk about the star myths for a second. It's undeniable that many members of the UFOs must be ETs all the way down through history, rely on or point to the myths and say the crossing of the Red Sea was caused by a UFO. It parted the waters. Or the vision of Ezekiel is describing an alien craft and yet in the language that they were trying to understand. And what I can bring but I didn't to go the there. I'm not, I'm not going there. But no, so I mean, many I understand have. that. Ra'el has... Ra'el tells you that when he was first contacted, they told him, come back tomorrow, the spacecraft with the tall alien, and said, come back tomorrow, bring your Bible, and I'll tell you all the things that we so did. So what? So well, what? There's all sorts of awesome. alien cults. There's all sorts of alien beliefs, and there's the whole nuts Anunnaki, and bolts. The whole Anunnaki and Sitchin and um, Velikovsky posits that a lot of these myths were, were a lot of these stories in the Bible the sun stood still for three days. That was because of Venus was swooping around, according to Velikovsky. Or the Anunnaki described in the uh, Mesopotamian epic. Overzealous. Came, we okay. get that people can become so married to their one kind of but hammer that everything looks like a nail. You know, let let's cut them some slack. Okay, because well, they me, were. <laughs> to me, everything in the myths can be, dis can be explained as celestial metaphor. I can show you. The crossing of the Red Sea. I can show you the Holy Grail. And so I can what? Show you the Ark of the so Covenant. what? What does that get you, David? I don't so understand where, stars, that, where that. So what? So there, you're, there, you're back to kind of. To me, though, you're just kind of back to pounding on the point that you that I conceded at the beginning. It's undeniable that there's this connection. So, so the question is who and wh who, yes. why, and what is the relation to ET and what is the relation to evil? So I, I, I don't deny it. Good. So therefore, if when people start getting too close to what actually happened, we trot out, well, it's all because of ancient aliens, that'll, le that'll lead us off into a rabbit hole. Well, you roll your eyes, but I'm saying, can we discount the possibility that, let's say, severe skepticism... Well, take me and, through and your scenario. Over. Where does that lead you to? It, if I can take you away from the uplifting power of the myths and say, well, let's take it back to, we, we thought it was all about these external characters such as Jesus and Moses. For centuries, we had them believing that, that it was literalistic. That kind of started to fall apart in the 20th century because of technology and other things going on. So people started to, our control system I don't know why you're rolling your eyes because this because is Because if you plug ET into yeah. the orchestrator of your myths, how does that lessen your story in any way? It's like you're because fighting it external. for no reason. Because now it's external again. These stories are now about 
What, well, it wasn't okay, about, they're not external. About, Where are they from then? Dynamic. They're not external. Where are they from? They could be from the spiritual realm. They could be what, from... What is the spiritual realm? Well, let's say, let's say that shamans or people... I know that term is overused, but around the world, there are people, there are institutions of the people who have contact with the realm that's not described by our materialist physics. Let's just talk about, for instance, you know, you have an ayahuasca experience or a mushroom experience and you're encountering and you're getting information that you wouldn't get otherwise. Or pe people don't need substances to do that. Drumming is used around the world and drums were actually, drumming was actually outlawed by the literalist Christians. When they got up to Northern Norway, they took away all the drums from the shamans. Or right, but David, this is, what, this is what I talk about all the time mm -hmm. on Skeptical, right? I got 200 shows on near-death experience because, yeah. not because I care about near-death experience so much as because it clearly crushes the materialistic paradigm because right. now we have a medical reason for that. So but, you know, know why, go why over and take the DMT, take the DMT experiments of Rick Strassman, and yeah. when they reach those other realms, ET is there. As much of, as well as all these shamanistic kind of things. Well, there you go. So, so ET doesn't well, no, there you go. Not. not. I mean, you you <laughs> kind of substituted one thing for another, but it doesn't explain the fundamental question of why would spirits, if you want to just put spirits in there, like you want to take ET out, and then you want to put spirits in. Okay, that's your choice, and then you want to put spirits in. Tell me why the spirits did it in this way. And, and did it in the stars and then did it, you know, with all these stories thread. I like your other explanation made more sense, which is, hey, it was some, uh, you didn't say Atlantis, but like some Atlantean ancient civilization that went around in boats. <laughs> well, there are two different explanations, Alex. I think we're actually in violent agreement because you just said we can get information from the other realm. So these star people, you said, look, there's been zillions of star people encounters around the world. Why did those star people have to come from the planet Sirius? If I go into the, if I go into the realm of the gods and I come back and describe it as gods, or I come back and describe it as something and someone says, oh, that's an E.T. Gray or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that that E.T. Gray came from the star Arcturus. Those I get you. Parties. This is the stuff I talk about all the time, but that's why I'm bringing it back to the star myth thing. And, and I, I keep bringing up the same question and, and you don't, I guess we're not on the same wavelength or, or you know. answer it different ways. But here's the thing. It's like, why, why is this particular esoteric wisdom? Mm -hmm. And let me back up and say, again, Dave, you've, you're the guy, you're the man. You're the one who's, who's kind of stood against the tide and said, hey, all this stuff is connected and you got 5,000 pages and now we have to go, wow, he did it. He single-handedly has established and made that undeniable. I'm going to the next question, which is saying, <laughs> I've talked to all these, I've talked to all these different people. I've talked to mediums. I've talked to near-death experiencers, out-of-body experience travelers, DMT, uh, ethnogen kind of people, all these people, sh shamanic people, all these people who are accessing the extended realm. I've never heard any stories about this kind of thing. There's, there, there's nothing like this in any of the other literature where they come down, if you will, that's maybe not right, where they come down and they say, we're going to put this in like a, a, a nursery school kind of book and say, here are the stars, here's the story, here's what to think about that. That is unique. There's nothing else like that. So why did they do it like that, do you suppose, from that extended realm, whether that extended realm was ET or not? Right. I mean, I, I actually think if we just take a breath, we are talking about, we're, we agree about all this non-materialistic paradigm. And if you go back through my blog post, I talk about NDEs, OBEs, because to explain that invisible realm it's like Mr. Miyagi explaining Karate Kid. Karate is invisible. That's my, the metaphor is karate is invisible. The myths are saying there's an infinite realm. You could call it the infinite realm. You could call it the dream time. You could call it the other world. I'm going to tell you about it. 
I'm going to use this broad canvas of the stars because they're perfect for explaining it. I'm not saying that the constellation Hercules is the god Zeus. The god Zeus is an entity that dwells in the invisible realm. And whether you want to say, well, he's part of your subconscious, Dave. Okay, I'll grant you that. I mean, our, our, but my subconscious connects to the realm of the gods because our subconscious can somehow, there's people who woke up during the Vietnam War. This is a, uh, an, an illustration I like to point out that shows that our subconscious knows a lot more than our mind can grasp. And, and any materialist will grant you that and say, yeah, your gut is gathering information that your mind doesn't even pay attention to. But our subconscious sometimes even knows things that it shouldn't be able to know, like I got a premonition that something horrible happened to my child and I woke up at two in the morning and later I got a call from the army and that was exactly when he was in this firefight in Vietnam and I'm a few continents away from Vietnam right now. Well, how did my subconscious get that message? Obviously, through the realm of the gods or whatever realm we want to call it, but it's outside of the materialist paradigm. So how do I explain the rules or not necessarily the rules, but the functioning of this invisible realm to people who their conscious mind or their egoic mind is going to choke on it. Just like how Mr. Miyagi taught karate to daniel son whose conscious mind would have choked on it. He said, hold on. I can't just tell you about how to stop Johnny's kick. I got to show you wax on wax off. That's how they show us somebody who knew all this stuff about all the things you're talking about, OBEs, NDEs, the invisible realm, the fact that we can, our subconscious can tap in somehow to the realm of the gods, and you can call it something else if you want, said, how am I going to explain the operation of this to people because they need it? It's profound, but it's also very practical. I'm going to use Mr. Miyagi's wax on, wax off. No, wait a minute. That's for karate. Okay, I'm going to use the stars because the stars arc up from one horizon and then he cross across the realm of spirit and then they sink down into the earth and that's and it's a perfect illustration of our condition here in this body of quote unquote clay which is water and dirt water and earth that's where the stars go down into they go down into the earth seemingly from our perspective okay. uh, and so uh, it's I'm, a I'm, perfect way of explaining it that's what i okay so, and so okay. The, whoever these people were Whoever these people, they, don't, please don't say whoever these people because were, because you just, you just had a God doing this, and now you say whoever these people were, are. Do you realize that's kind of confusing? You can't say, say was, there was some God sitting up on a cloud, and I one of the gods decided, hey, my way of going to do this is going to be through uh, these star myths, and that's yeah. how I'm going to do it. You know, right. Then you can't switch and then say these people, because then that's kind of out of the... So that, and, and what I'm pushing you on is that I've talked to all these different people who have accessed the extended consciousness realm, and that kind of way that you're thinking, it doesn't come up at all. So of I'm course it does. That you all the shamanic, all the shamanic, read Mercia Eliade's book, Shamanism. No, you're, you're, you're misinterpreting, you're misinterpreting okay. what I'm saying. All those what, what I'm saying... What yeah, I, I'm not done. Story. You're gonna. You're now gonna tell me how okay. the shamans had all these myths too, which is back to proving to me that it's undeniable that all the myths. I get it. <laughs> okay. I get it. So I keep coming back to so why. I keep coming back to cultures. why would they do it in this way that is so you know kind of uniquely uh, peculiar in terms of how it's done. I mean, okay, like that's an interesting question. Well, I've been asking for a freaking hour. <laughs> well, I'm, I was in the infantry. <laughs> I played I football. Injuries. I have a lot of head injuries. I, I need it explained to me. Infantry simple, man. <laughs> so, look, I might, not be, I, might, I might not be the fastest one to pick up on the question you're actually asking, but what I'm saying is why couldn't this ancient culture, this ancient sophisticated culture that was so much more ancient than, than the ancient Egyptians, the earliest ancient Egyptian dynasty or dynasty was ancient to us, but it was only 5,000 years ago. Gobekli Tepe, according to radiocarbon dating of the walls, must have been buried by 8,000 BC. So it was as ancient to the earliest Egyptian dynasty as the earliest ancient Egyptian dynasty is to us and probably more ancient. So this more ancient culture, I say whoever they were because we don't know who they were, but why could they not have been using shamanic techniques, and I know that word's overused, but these techniques that you talk about, the NDEs, OBEs, to tap into the realm of the gods and put together this system, why did they put it together this way? 
the same way that the same reason that Mr. Miyagi taught Daniel son that way, because our egoic minds, which is a defense mechanism for dealing with this world that we found ourselves in from infancy, it defends us. It's there. It's like doubting Thomas. Why was doubting Thomas so doubtful? Those doubts were his defense mechanism from getting burned. When they said, we've seen Jesus, he said, yeah, right. I'll believe it when I touch it. The defense, our mind is a defense mechanism. Daniel son had all kinds of defense mechanisms because he'd been hurt. He'd been, he was full of doubts and he was a very untrusting individual. And Mr. Miyagi said, the way to reach this kid is not through the direct route. It's through the indirect route. And the people who put this myths together, and I don't admit that it had to have extraterrestrials from the planet circling Arcturus. It could have been a sophisticated human culture that was tapped into this and said, how am I going to teach this? Well, we know that our mind, our defense mechanism mind that deals with culture is going to choke on it, just like daniel So we're going to have to use the Mr. Miyagi route and go around. Where did they get this incredible wisdom? Maybe from the realm of the gods, which they might have accessed through plants. They might have accessed through breathing. I don't know how they accessed it because it was so far in advance of ancient Egypt Nobody can tell you for sure. But if someone tells you for sure it was Arcturians, then my skeptical meter goes, bing, how the hell do you know it was for sure Arcturians? Well, because we found a craft. Well, what if I say that craft could have been Nazis? You go, what do you mean Nazis? Well, they were working on some pretty advanced craft, and that was 1942. So don't tell me you're sure it's Arcturians. That could be a Saya. That's what I'm saying for sure. But we've... (laughs) I thought we probably frustrated the hell out of our audience, but maybe so. I've had a good time. You frustrated them now. It's not me. <laughs> yeah, I, no, it was me. I take I take blame, but hey, it's my show. I get to do what I want once a week. <laughs> well, like I said, I think every single individual brings out something different, and you certainly brought out. You took it in some different ways, and I think that's valuable. I don't uh, I don't have any problem with confrontation because, as you noticed, I was in, or as you mentioned, I was in the military. I don't necessarily love to go that route, but I don't really have a thin skin. I mean, I've, I've been called everything while I was in the army. Well, we, we are, we are con- confronting on, you know, like we both have said, you know, we're 90% agreement. And, and the most fundamental thing that you're saying is this return to self is, is I, I've recapped the story over and over again, but it, it's phenomenal to think that the star myth hypothesis that you've established so beautifully has this deeper connection with all the great wisdom traditions that tell us that the real journey is the journey to our self and that that's the journey that we should put foremost in our life. And then there's all these awesome, awesome stories that are inspiring. You know, I mean, it's not my cup of tea, but it's inspiring to so many people and has been throughout the ages. And, and is that what, how, final question, and then we'll, we'll leave the skeptical board for a minute. What is, what is your personal kind of way that you like to kind of learn and relate? And I guess, why do the, the myths and allegory, why do you think that that draws you in? Because I like to see connections. That's a really good question. I like to see connections between things. And that's what metaphors do. They show connections between, it's like, I want to show you this new concept. I'm going to connect it to something that you know a little better to get you across the river to this other side. And I'm going to use something that you, some stepping stones that will help you across that river. And that's what the myths I think are doing. I mean, that's what Mr. Miyagi is doing with Danielson. Danielson had no conception of conception of, this martial art that he wanted to teach him. So he taught him through something more familiar and got him to the other side. And it's like a magical moment that everyone remembers when the lights finally go on for Daniel sound, like his mind jumps across the river. Well, these connections between the stars, what are these constellations, if not us connecting the stars and then connecting them to our condition in order to convey these, like I said, profound, but also very practical truths about each and every about yourself and then each and every other man and woman you ever meet that they have this invisible component as well and that's what that's why we have to 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 uh you know respect and you know we we had this kind of discussion that got a little heated but i recognize that every single other person that i meet is this other 
has this divine components that's down here wrestling with this physical world. It's like that's why they say namaskaram or namaste is I, the, 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 that part of me recognizes that part of you and we're down here wrestling with this. I'm not mad about it. I don't get mad about that. And, I try, and if we all took that view, then maybe we would be uh, more uh, better off as a society. But anyway, I do actually have a hard stop in like four minutes. So if we could... Um, you know, Let's do that then. Then I'll yeah, tell you yeah, what. But I think the, it's been a great conversation. Oh, I, I so appreciate it, and I and I the the work is phenomenal. I've said that enough. So, David, you, you write some, as you alluded to, some fantastic blog posts that cover a variety of topics. You podcast as well, so people need to check out these books to get the kind of background. But where can they stay more up to date on your kind of minute by minute stuff? Yeah, thanks, Alex. So I have a website that is called starmythworld.com. So if you remember Star Myths of the World, it's starmythworld.com. You can really just search for my last name and the word stars and you'll probably stumble upon something. But starmythworld.com has tons of content. And there's two exciting events coming up. I'll be in October. I'll be at the Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge where Robert Schock will be there, Carmen Bolter, Alan Green. Uh, Christopher Dunn, Walter Cruttenden. That's October 4th, 5th, and 6th. And there's a discount code if you want to sign up. Just put my last name, Matheson, in the discount code. You get $50 off on that one. That's in Newport Beach, California. That'll be cool. Lots of great speakers will be there. And then there's another event in April of 2020. That one's almost sold out. It's with the guys from Grimerica. I know you know them. And also a couple guys from the Brothers of the Serpent podcast, a newer podcast, really interesting. That'll be in the, uh, the high altitude desert near Bryce Canyon. We'll be going to Bryce Canyon to look at the stars, talk about the myths and all these topics that Alex and I just discussed. That'll be in April of 2020. And that's contact at the cabin.com. So you can check out the details there on that. It's almost sold out though. Awesome, yeah. David. Fantastic. You're great, man. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for, thanks for going in that direction and keeping me, uh, you know, under pressure uh, causes you to articulate more clearly what you're trying to say. So I'm, I'm all, I'm all for it. You're using the old Socratic method on me there. I see from your ancient Greek roots, Alex. All right. Thanks a lot. It's been really fun and we'll talk again. Thanks again to David Matheson for joining me today on Skeptico. Final question. I guess I'd tee up from this episode and since I probably frustrated the heck out of Dave with this question, I might as well ask you all, who created the star myths? So if you've listened to that show, I don't need to add any more context to that. But I would love to hear your answer. The best place, if you're interested in interacting with me and other listeners, is probably through the Skeptico Forum. You can find it from the Skeptico website which is at S-K-E-P-T-I-K. And while you're there, of course, you can find links to all our previous episodes, over 400 of them, all available for free. Download, you just get the MP3 and you're off and can do what you like. Thanks so much for joining me on Skeptico. I do have, I think, some really good shows coming up. I'm continuing to just kind of pound on these issues that are important to me. I'm trying to figure some stuff out. So this show might sound a little bit different from other book interview shows you hear, but hey, that's kind of my, that's kind of my agenda, if you will. So I hope you stick around. I hope you share it with anyone you think would be interested in it. And until next time, take care and bye for now. <music>